really lucky to have him here. Everybody, Matt Dillahunty. I so want to, it, is my mic on? Am I on? You want to check my levels? I so want to do you right now, it's just not even funny. <laughs> hey, it's my first Skepticon. <laughs> what took me so fucking long? So um, before, I, before I get started, I, I'm, thank you, JT and Lauren Lane and all the people who put Skepticon 5 together and all of you who are here. Um, I have, there's somebody else, uh, or there's someone who hadn't been to Skepticon before. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about debates today, but I wanted to show you a video um, from somebody that I greatly admire. Oh, there's no video. How did we do this? We tested this just before. It's not muted. It's at 97%. Try it again. Volume on. <laughs> this guy. Oh, thanks so much for that wonderful introduction. Matt, you're not so bad yourself. Hello, Skepticon 5. I'm happy to be here. This is my first Skepticon ever, and I wanted to do something a little bit special. Unfortunately, trying to do a close-up card trick in front of a huge group of people from a stage really just doesn't work out. And so what I've done instead is to actually record this and hope that you enjoy it. Today at Skepticon, I'm going to be talking about debates, but like many skeptics, I've had a keen interest in magic for my entire life. I'm also an ardent advocate of alliteration. I like to make use of the aces because it allows me to tell amusing stories about how assessing apologist arguments always aggravates and annoys. But jokes aside, Let's talk a little bit about debates. I've been doing more and more debates, and I've found a lot of similarities and some problems. And one of the things that I've attempted to do is to make a section of every debate be about directing questions back and forth between the parties. Otherwise, it ends up looking too much like a joint press conference. The traditional debate format is a back and forth over the course of several rounds where each side has already pre-constructed the things that they're gonna say without knowing what the other side is actually gonna talk about. Yes, we know the subject of the debate, but apologists don't always stick to the subject of the debate. One common tactic is to make several arguments in rapid succession in the hopes that one of them gets through without a sufficient rebuttal. That's a problem. You can't, you can't have time to address everything they're gonna say. And so when I do my opening arguments, I tend to make sure that instead of focusing on specific arguments against the existence of God, I instead focus on the substance behind the argument so that everybody understands the burden of proof. We need people to understand that. Apologists, will also appeal to academic authorities and antiquated arguments. You can't address all of them most of the time. Something's gonna get through. I try to make sure that when I'm in a debate, I focus on the fallacies and point out the limitations in the arguments that they're presenting. I want people to understand the value of critical thinking and the value of questioning all claims. In arguments about the existence of God, for example, the apologist will arrogantly assume that the anthropic principle demonstrates design. But they've got it exactly backward. They're leading the evidence where they want it to go. If you take a look at the anthropic principle, you'll find that it's backed by real data, real science, real evidence. But the apologists have somehow managed to get everything about it backwards. We weren't designed by a god. The universe wasn't designed to fit us. We evolved to fit the portion of the universe that we inhabit. We need people to recognize the value of following the evidence where it leads 
instead of leading the evidence where you'd like it to go. When all else fails in debates, apologists will just occasionally pull something right out of their ass. We need to make sure we speak to what we know and avoid focusing on irrelevancies. The final stage of the most debates are closing arguments. And what apologists will attempt to do is point to all the things that you didn't address as if their unanswered assertions have accumulated into a winning hand. But the plural of anecdote is not data. And hopefully we've given people the tools they need to look behind the remaining arguments and see the truth. They're not backed by solid evidence. They're backed by fallacies and appeals to faith and special ways of knowing. They've attempted to smuggle their God into the conversation without relying on good evidence. And this is cheating. As we educate people in these debates, Hopefully, we're teaching them how to assess the arguments, because if they know where the burden of proof rests, and they question everything, and justify all claims with evidence, they'll tend to be right more often than not. Let's get started. Thank you. I think I actually did it better last night when I was drunk, but I'm, I'm a little hypercritical. Yes, and that's, that's actually, I'll do a side note, because I'm going to get distracted 20 times. I want to get to as many questions as possible, because uh, it's, woo, because I love the Q&A, and hopefully you guys have questions and you're awake. Can, can we kill that? Because I don't need it anymore, and it's going to blind me with that blue flashing light in my face. Um, so on the, the, the thing with the, the devil in you, the devil is screaming at me. Um, I used to, when I was in the Navy, I would do card tricks, and there were people who clearly had been raised um, to just in the absence of, uh, of leisure domain and would come up and go, oh, you know, I don't want to mess with you. You've got some kind of, and it's stupid. I mean, really bad card tricks sometimes. But so anyway, thanks for having me here. Uh, those of you who don't know, my name is Matt Delaney. I'm the president of the Atheist Community of Austin, the host of our TV show and uh, on public access. Um, also, nonprofits, when we actually have time to do it, yes, please don't beat me up about the fact that we haven't been doing episodes. And uh, I am proud to say that I am, at least in part, one of the producers of a podcast called Godless Bitches, which, uh, oh, you've heard of that. Yeah. I think Skepticon next year should maybe have Godless Bitches up here, but I'm not completely unbiased. I wanted to talk a little bit before I take questions about some of the debates I've done over the last couple of years, not just on the TV show, but specifically the big formal debates. But first, I want to address something about the show. I've been doing it for seven years or so. I am easily my own worst critic. Um, I leave the show beating myself up, replaying the show in my head, figuring out what I could do better. So for those of you who, like some others, have recognized that once upon a time, Matt used to have this much patience, and now Matt has this much patience, you're right. Uh, I, am, I am not always uh, nice, I am not always patient, and uh, it's one of the reasons why I've been doing fewer shows in recent months. I travel a lot, but also I wanted to get other people and other voices in there. But I can tell you that I've been analyzing why this is and why my frustration level has climbed. And it is not because I am tired of or done dealing with the arguments that apologists make. I can't get enough of that. I will go out and debate the guys that are standing out there. I'll debate at universities. I have had conversations on airplanes going back and forth from events. I love it. It's what I live for. Um, it may sound weird, but the biggest problem with our TV show is the fucking phone system. For whatever reason, it doesn't do full duplex, especially if you have cell phones. And so somebody will start talking, and I will need to stop them in order that they don't spend 10 minutes building up an argument that's, that begins with a fallacy, uh, just so that we have to go back to the beginning. And I will be there, but, 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 no, 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 hang on, hang on, Tom, 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 hey, hey, Tom. And by this time, I'm done. And so we're gonna, we have bought a building, the ACA has bought a building this past year. We are renovating the front room. I didn't pay for it, but yeah, good for them. Uh, we are renovating the front room into a full-on studio, so that whenever we want to, we could do more shows. We could do shows at different times and different time zones. 
we can get out of the public access studio and have full control over the audio and the phones, and maybe we can get back to the point where we can have civil conversations. The other aspect of this that's a bit of a pain in the ass is that I try to make sure that I get, give as good as I get on the show, that, that people who call in to actually have legitimate conversations get to have conversations. And the people who call in to preach can go screw themselves because there's a million shows about preaching and this one's not, or at least not about preaching what they want. So the first big public debate that I did was um, against uh, Father Hans Jacobsy on the source of human morality. Uh, we did this at, at UMBC and it was the weirdest thing ever because I'd been doing this for a long time, but I hadn't stepped out into the, we're at a university and we're doing a structured formal debate, you know, because I'm just, I'm, you know, I don't have a degree in peanuts. I mean, nothing. And it's just what I do. I get there. I've never talked to anybody who's orthodox in his way, um, which is weird. I don't have time to go into all of it. But he stood up here, up there, and said, oh, Matt's different from all those other atheists. Matt's a sincere, honest searcher. He's the kind of guy that I could go out and have a beer with because we're both looking for the truth. And he met me like 30 seconds before this. Um, he also spent the bulk of the debate agreeing with me that you can, in fact, arrive at correct moral principles through purely secular means. And I'm sitting there, I've been, Previous to this, for about two years, I ran around doing a talk called The Superiority of Secular Morality. I retired that talk because um, I don't like giving structured talks, but also because Sam Harris came out with a moral landscape and it pretty much agrees with most of what I was saying anyway, so I just like, go read Sam's book and save me so I can go back to ask, a answering questions and arguing with people. Uh, I am gonna give that talk one more time, I think in a month or so in a, in a revamped form, but I'd spend a lot of time talking about this and thinking about it. He spends all this time during the debate agreeing with me, and then he gets to speak last. How many of you guys have seen this debate? Because it's on YouTube, yeah. These people can tell you that I'm not exaggerating. I don't know who the hell I was debating through the, the first part of the debate. Uh, this is the biggest Jekyll and Hyde thing I've ever seen. He gets up in his closing after agreeing with me and saying that yes, you can get to correct moral principles through purely secular means, and then stands up and starts ranting about porn and Nazis and gulags and how secularism necessarily leads to the destruction of the fucking universe. <laughs> it was crazy. And when, he, and when he, there was about 400 people here or so, and when he mentioned Nazis and tried to link them to atheism, there was a big groan. And up until this point, I had no idea where the audience stood, you know, how many were on which side or whatever. And, and quite honestly, I would rather have, no offense to all you, I love being here, but if I'm doing a debate, I want all of you to be theists, because I have no reason at all to sit here and tell you why God doesn't exist. I mean, you already know. The, uh, he, had, he had previously said that he wanted to have a beer with me, and he, this was in his closing remarks. Luckily, there was a Q&A period after the closings, something I would advocate for because of this. If there hadn't been a Q&A, his last remarks would have stood and people would have walked out without hearing that he sat up there and lied, trying to tie atheism to the Nazis. And somebody who loved me dearly, evidently, stood up during the Q&A, like the second or third question, and basically said, hey, Matt, what do you think of his closing? <laughs> and I said that, uh, I actually wouldn't go drink with him because I don't drink with people who are so dishonest as to attempt to do something like that in a closing where I wouldn't have had a chance to respond. I uh, debated Mark Allison in uh, Gainesville, Georgia. This was also about morality. Because I'd been talking about morality for, for so long, people just kept saying, hey, let's have a debate on morality and we'll get that Matt guy. Come on down. Um, this was also kind of weird and I don't, have, I don't have a bad word to say about Mark. By the way, almost everybody I've ever debated, um, I like them, I would debate them again, I am friendly with them, probably hang out with them, those who drink, I'll happily drink with, except for Father Jacobsy. He can go screw himself. But <laughs> Mark Allison, a really nice guy, his first debate, we're debating morality, and again, he stands up there and this time not only agrees with me that you can get to correct moral positions from secular uh, values, 
But he says during the debate that I'm going to win the debate. Um, so I don't really count that one that much. Uh, the, uh, there's, there's a poor question, and only the most extremely deluded theists think that you can't be good without God. It's only a fringe group of people who really think that you're all immoral. Instead, what, what a lot of them will try and do is co-opt the good that we do and give that credit to their God. Oh, you're only God because God wrote his morality in your heart, or you're only God because you grew up in a culture surrounded by good, God-fearing Christians who taught you how not to be an asshole. Well, I wish he'd have taught you, because you don't get to take the good work that I do for good reasons and give credit to your imaginary friend. You do not have any moral high ground. One of the common claims on morality that I've had to deal with, um, and I dealt with it recently, even though we weren't, by the way, every debate turns out to be about morality. If you're not ready for that, so far, no matter what we're debating, morality becomes the biggest issue. But there's this claim that's come up several times, which is, well, without God, you don't have any ultimate justice. That guy who rapes and tortures and murders an entire family and doesn't get caught, he gets away scot-free under your atheist system. Yeah, yeah, he does. He, sorry, the universe is cruel. But you know what? At least I don't believe in a system where this guy can live a terrible life, destroying other people's lives, and at the end to say, hey, God, I'm sorry, and he gets to go live in paradise, and I get to burn. That's not a moral system. That is immoral. The next debate that I recall, because some of them are fading, uh, Abdu Murray and I went to Amarillo, Texas, to debate, should America be a nation under God? I was so excited for this debate um, because it wasn't about morality, um, and then it was. We Basically, his argument was that we have this inalienable right, that these inalienable rights come from God, and it says so right in the Declaration of Independence. Checkmate. Um, I don't want to slight him too much because he's, he's very well spoken. He's a nice guy. He made a better case than most of the other individuals that uh, could have tried to debate this subject. But in retrospect, because I analyze these things over and over again, there is one point, and there was a lot of back and forth, and I love, I live the back and forth. Um, there was one point where I had said that, you know, when you kill people, you've taken away their right to life. Because in an attempt to demonstrate that rights, in fact, are alienable. Um, and he got up and said, no, you didn't. You violated their right to life. You didn't take it away. And I wish, I didn't think of this until afterwards, because sometimes I'm slow. I wish I'd have said, so wait a minute, dead people have rights? We're violating the rights of dead people? Because that's really what he was advocating. He had tried to twist this around. He really needed there to be inalienable rights. And I had been asked flatly, and, and I have been in other debates, do you think there are inalienable rights? No, I don't. I think rights are the things that we grant. What good is it to have a right that nobody's going to recognize or enforce or protect? Oh, you have this right, but you can't do anything about it. That's right up there with saying, like, I have ultimate free will, but I can't jump any higher than that. <clears throat> we got to talk about original intent, which I was happy to do because it gave me the opportunity to point out that not only are the liars like wall builders and David Barton misrepresenting the intent of the founders, but the original intent of the founders doesn't matter one bit. It doesn't matter to us. We are not, they, their intent was for us to not be locked into what their intent was. The fact that they had, the fact that they attributed rights to God is no more relevant than the fact that they had slaves. We figured out that that was wrong. We can figure out that this attribution of rights to God is also wrong. We got to talk about the secular foundations during that debate. The next debate is one of my favorites because it was my first team debate. And there's this guy, uh, uh, oh, it's JT. Uh, <laughs> JT came down to Texas, uh, which you need to do more often, by the way. I don't know where you went. But, um, hey, 
Uh, and we debated uh, John Farrar, who is amazingly arrogant, like would give William Lane Craig a run for his money. And it was uh, Lee, Sloan, Sloan Lee, that's right. And the subject was, does a God exist? And I, had, I was tired, I mean, we, granted, we're not gonna do morality, although we did. Um, I, I sat down with JT ahead of time, we talked a little bit, and I had been wanting to try out a new strategy, something I'll talk about a little later. Wow, I am gonna run out of time. Um, basically, what I did was I, I started the meta argument at that point. It became my new basis, a little bit I talked about in the card trick. JT kicked everybody's ass and the merits of all of the arguments that were out there. It was like rapid fire, it was shotgun, it was beautiful. He was like spraying with a big old hose. No, all your arguments are stupid. <laughs> and I got to st sit there and say, you know, yeah, their arguments are stupid, but we've been having this debate forever. These arguments, they get debunked and refuted and you hide them away in a box for a little while and then next year you pull it back out and shine it up and maybe change a premise and look I've got a new argument for God and no you don't meanwhile it, the God that you believe in is the sort of thing that we wouldn't need to present any sort of argument for this the, these people believe in a God that interacts with reality in a way that should be detectable he answers prayer he finds card key, keys he doesn't do much for amputees, but he finds car keys. <laughs> he told my mother things, all kinds of things about me. By the way, when I, when I finally came out, I'd been worried about my mom uh, panicking about you know, me being an atheist and going to hell. Um, and I, sh sh it was answered prayer. She was happy because she knew something was very, very wrong with me for all those years and had been asking God to tell her what it was. And finally, God told her through me. I can't, there's, you can't win. No matter what you do, God's going to get the credit. Uh, there was one little problem, though, in the debate that we did um, in North Texas, and that was that I have a little bit of an ego uh, and a little bit of a chip on my shoulder because um, unlike uh, some of my friends, Richard Carrier, brilliant, PhD, woo, I got nothing. I'm completely self-taught. I just love doing this stuff, and so... Um, it's like, hey, can you hang with these guys? The first time I figured out that, yes, in fact, you can hang with those guys is when a PhD philosophy student came to our Thursday happy hour and wanted to uh, debate me on something. And I was like, okay. And he sat there for 30 or 40 minutes making the claim that because you are either going to win the lottery or not, that the odds are 50-50. <laughs> Don't need a degree from UT. Um, but I, I have a little chip on my shoulder, and so John Farrar's up there, and he's pontificating about all these classical arguments of God, and uh, when it came to the uh, ontological argument, he flatly said that, uh, I have examined all possible refutations of this, and they are all false. And, and his version of the moral argument that he presented, this is my, as far as I'm aware, unique presentation of the moral argument, uh, which prompted me in my head to say that then it's just as stupid as everybody else's, but you can't do that in a debate. But my ego steps in, I can't let John Farrar leave that thing thinking that he's smarter than me. So there was this philosophical penis measuring contest that took place <laughs> in the middle of the debate where we were using terms that nobody in the audience was gonna get, or at least a good chunk of the audience was like, what the fuck are these guys talking about? This is so boring. And I did it partly to let John look boring and partly so that he knew uh, that I could hang. And then JT did the wonderful thing, which was he stepped in and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can we talk English? I'm just a music major. And brought it right back down to where the audience wanted it in the first place. And it was great. We got to do everything we wanted in that debate. Uh, it was, thank you, by the way. I did, uh, I debated Jay Lucas on Does God Exist? That one's online too. Jay actually traumatized the audience by asking them to imagine traumatic events like rape in order to claim that this idea that there's no justice for those perps if there is no God. Um, this was another debate about the existence of God that was entirely about morality. I mean, he didn't, I'm here, I didn't know whether he was gonna defend God in the abstract sense like many apologists do or if he was gonna get specific. He got specific, 
right out the gate. I'm here to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you can't have morality without it. And I was like, oh, great. Um, I'm branching out a bit, though. A couple weeks ago, I debated Christine Kruselnicki from the Secular Pro-Life Organization. How many people have seen that? Yeah. They, uh, they had set up a booth at the last American Atheist Convention, and I'd heard about it, and I was pissed. Uh, not because, hey, there's secular people I disagree with on any number of things. I know there are people uh, who hold all these positions. They're entitled to it. Great. They should have a booth there. I have no problem with that. Uh, the problem I had was that they started getting press, and the press represented this as not a secular pro-life position, but the secular pro-life position. And uh, my ego said, no, 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 no. Uh, you don't get to represent me that way, so we'll have a debate. Uh, they, they sent Christine down uh, to Texas. Uh, on, she was way outnumbered. And the debate's online. It's, it's, um, I ended up, I had to kind of take it easier on it at the end. I couldn't say some of the things I said because the crowd had already turned against her. Um, and at that point, one of the things you have to do when you're debating is make sure that you don't lose the moral high ground, that you don't lose the crowd is the important thing, and that you don't kick people when they're down. So what I wanted to say was that um, Christine's position, by the way, was personhood and hard personhood, that the fetus is a person from the instant of conception, and she makes no exceptions for rape or incest. She has an internally consistent position, and this is what I wanted to say. She has done the work, and she has an internally consistent position. It's just consistently wrong. And while other people have taken the steps to consider the, the difficulties with personhood and make exceptions for rape and incest, those people are now hypocrites. They have an intellectually invalid position, but they are more humane than Christine is. I didn't actually do that because I figured it would be like poking her with sharp sticks at the end. She also put up a video of uh, aborted fetus bits, which, and that was in her opening. Um, so it was pretty much over at that point. Um, I will say, on a side note, Christine's no longer with the secular pro-life organization. There are a number of them who make exceptions for rape and incest, and while they were ultimately competent or confident in her ability to come down and have a debate and win and just, I don't know, kick my baby killing ass all over the place, when it didn't go down that way, they agreed to part company. And uh, I don't, I hate the anti-choice position that they try to label as pro-life. Uh, I make no secret about that at all. Uh, I also hate intellectual hypocrisy. But more than that, if you set somebody up to do your dirty work and then throw them under the bus when they don't do it as well as you'd like, you're a despicable human being. And so I announced that my new goal is to debate everybody in the secular pro-life organization so that they have to kick all of them out. <laughs> and since they have about four supporters, I can do it Monday through Thursday and go out and drink on Friday. <laughs> where, where am I at on time? I don't, I don't know. I, I think I've been at it like 30 minutes or so. Okay. So some lessons learned from the debates that I've done. Number one, prepare for everything, and you're still going to be unprepared. Some of them are very predictable. You can go watch the debates that they've done, if they've done it before, and you know exactly what they're going to say. But in my first few debates, I did not want to know anything at all about my opponent, because I know myself. And if I go and prepare for that person instead of the issue, and they don't show up with the same things that I expected, I'm gonna look like a dipshit. Because I'm now arguing something that's different from what they're arguing. What ends up happening is what happened in the last debate I did two weeks ago, uh, Cliff Connectly, we were at Texas State University, and we were supposed to be debating, is belief in the Christian God rational? Cliff's opening consisted of several of the classic arguments for the existence of God, which do not and cannot get you anywhere near Christianity. At most, you can get to once upon a time, there probably was something that we might have maybe labeled a god, and that's as close as you can get. And then his only argument that specifically related to Christianity was the resurrection. He believes the resurrection, and he believes it because it's in the Bible. And during the Q&A back and forth, I asked him, should anybody believe 
the resurrection because of your word. And he's like, no, no, absolutely not. This is about evidence and reason and using your brain and investigating. And I was like, great. Now, if we shouldn't believe it because you say so, why should we believe it because a handful of anonymous books tell us so? Oh, well, because they knew Jesus. Uh, hang on. How do you know they knew Jesus? Isn't it because those same anonymous books tell you? I mean, aren't, aren't, isn't this becoming rapidly a circular argument? In his closing, though, in defense of the rationality of Christianity, he did nothing to defend the rationality of Christianity. Now, it was easily, I, I'm, I'm pretty harsh with myself, but it's easily one of my worst debate performances, uh, which is unfortunate because it was in front of a crowd of primarily Christians. Uh, I'd been sick and I was sluggish and I was sitting down and reading my notes and Cliff is a street preacher. So he's up here doing this. Oh, yeah. And don't you understand? And his closing is, look, without Jesus, you can't have any meaning or purpose in your life. The unexamined life isn't worth living. Don't you want to have purpose? You've got to come to Jesus. And this was his defense for the rationality of Christianity. Um, so I think on the merits, I still, you know, kicked him in the teeth. But as far as who did a better job in the debate, Cliff did. Do I think I lost that debate? Well, I certainly think I lost it in some people's eyes. Um, and I, because here's the thing, debates aren't necessarily about who has the facts or who's right. Conversations and little arguments are that way, but debates aren't. Debates are performance pieces. They are, unfortunately, popularity contests, but they're good. You need to how you craft the argument, what you say, matters more in a debate. Tell stories. Make analogies that connect with people. I'm not talking about making strict emotional appeals as your argument. I'm talking about appeal to emotions that conform to and support your argument. You need, we, we need to be viewed as compassionate, feeling human beings. We are. We have to let people know this because for so long, atheist was evil, atheist was destructive, atheist was, oh, those are, you can't have love. One of my first things my dad told me is, of course you can be moral, but you can't ever love anybody because love comes from God. <laughs> Made me sad. Because I love my dad. Try to focus on educating people rather than just rebutting arguments. At the end of the day, if I don't have a single answer to the anthropic principle or uh, an ontological argument or a particular variation of the ontologic argument that is John Farrar's that nobody's ever seen before, it doesn't matter because what I'm there to do is to teach people where the burden of proof is, how to evaluate claims, to question everything, and to understand that even if I can't and no one can rebut their argument, it doesn't stand. We don't believe things until they're debunked. We withhold belief or we should, if we're skeptics, until the evidence supports it. Try to have time for direct questions if you're gonna do debates. It's my favorite part of every debate. It's been the most useful. It's what avoids making it look like a joint press conference where I talk and you talk and I talk and you talk, because you're already gonna be talking past each other. So if the whole thing is talking past each other, I find it to be a little bit wasteful. Try to have some short nuggets for the classic arguments that you know are coming. They don't always have to be the same. Um, if there's time, I might give examples for some of them. I want to make sure I get to questions. On the show and in debates, I try a bunch of different tactics to see what sticks because no one argument is going to work for everybody. People are reached by different things. And I've addressed Pascal's wager, I don't know, infinity plus one uh, times. And, uh, and by the way, I know that's wrong. So the math major shouldn't come up here and like kick my ass or anything afterwards. But one of the other big things and this came up in the last debate too, is be honest and admit that you don't know something when you don't know it. I was terrified of public speaking. It's one of the reasons why I didn't become a minister. I am not terrified of public speaking anymore. I, I'm sweating like a pig because it's hot up here, but uh, I, I'm never nervous, in part because these are my peeps, but <laughs> also because I'm not trying to bullshit anybody. I talk about what I know, and if I don't know it, I don't know. I may try to think of an answer, I may try to, you know, let's think about it and talk about it, but I'm not gonna, I don't have to pretend. And I don't talk about, I don't try to defend things that I don't actually believe. I don't know how some people do that. I don't know how, you know, I've seen the, the professional debate teams where you prepare to defend both sides, fuck that. 
I mean, I, I realize that's really good training to help you think about what the other side's doing, and it's what I do in the car on the drive back and forth to work. I have debates with myself, but I don't ever want to be in public defending something that I don't actually believe. I'll do it, you know, maybe, maybe in an academic setting it might be fun, you know, where nobody's expecting anything, but for things like this, I don't know how people can defend things that they don't believe. So I'm going to get to questions in a second, but in closing I wanted to say this. I love to debate. I'm not always the best at it. I'm not always in the best mood, whether we're talking about on the TV show, where sometimes I'm an ass and sometimes I'm not. Um, but I love formal and informal debates. I don't just think or believe that there's value in debating. I know there's value in it. I get emails on a regular basis from people who've given up their religious beliefs or their woo beliefs and now identify as atheists and skeptics because of the work we've done on the show or because debates that I've had out in public. There have been at least a dozen people here at Skepticon, and that's just a rough guess, who have come up to say that the show has been critical to the changes in their life and the debates that we've done have been extremely helpful in helping them formulate better arguments, talk to the people that they care about, and engage. That's why I will keep taking the crazy calls. Don't let everyone, anyone ever get away with saying that it's pointless to debate believers. I was a fundamentalist Christian for 25 years or more, and if there hadn't been people who were interested in doing debates, if they hadn't been interested in publicly challenging ideas under fire, I would probably be somewhere else preaching from the Bible. After Abdul Murray and I debated in Amarillo, Texas, which, by the way, um, despite JT trying to prop me up as major celebrity guy, uh, nobody knows who I am outside of communities like this. We're in Amarillo, Texas. I had no idea who Abdul Murray is. Anybody else ever heard of him? He's got a little ministry somewhere. Um, Amarillo, Texas. Somewhere between 600 and 700 people came to that debate. I was floored. It was they, they filled all the chairs, they brought in extra chairs, they lined the walls, they, I was like, there was like a circle of people right in front of me. I felt like I was back in church camp giving little lessons. Six to seven hundred people, and a lot of them were brought in from churches. Abdu may have been a much bigger draw, I don't know. But I got an email from a 13-year-old boy right after that debate, and his parents were non-religious and they had been encouraging him to explore all of these ideas. And they'd taken him around to churches and events and showed him information, let him investigate on his own. They took him to that debate, and he left and went home and sent me an email that said, I'm free to make up my own mind, and my parents have been encouraging me to explore this, but because of what you said last night, I'm now identifying as an atheist. Don't let anybody ever tell you that this does not work. I think we can and should continue with debates. I think we, I, I want to do more debates. I take vacation from my day job to come to events like this and to do debates. And uh, while I'm happy to come down to local groups and talk and, and do community building, because I definitely think that we need to do a better job of, of building bigger and better communities, um, I'm saving a portion of my vacation days uh, to do debates. I'm going to be doing more of them, and I'm going to be doing them on more subjects. I've said that I'm a friend to the religious and an enemy to their religion. And I want to get the snake oil salesman to be forced to defend their batshit crazy religious beliefs in public so that the people can see behind the curtain and watch them defend specifics with abstract banal generalities. That will tell you the strength of the case that they're making. I want the person in the pew floundering around with statements like, well, <laughs> of course I don't believe that stuff. Because if they're on defense, they're not out proselytizing. But mostly, I want to help them reach the point where they can say, yeah, I, I don't believe any of that. Why do you? Like the rest of us here. That's why I'll keep debating. That's why I want to see more people debating. Thank you. Do you have questions?
Did I leave time for questions? I don't know if I left time for questions or not. I got about five minutes. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, is somebody I've ever debated contacted me to let me know I've altered their position? Uh, yes and no. None of, the, none of the people from the formal debates, uh, the major public debates have done that. There is a guy who emailed the show and said, he won't tell me his name, but he said, I called into the show over and over again about five years ago. I hated you, thought you were an asshole. I just called in to make you look stupid. And eventually I got tired of calling and arguing with you, and I just sat there and watched. And I just wanted to let you know I'm an atheist now. So. <laughs> It, it does happen, yeah. Yes, sir. Did you study to uh, be a minister when you were younger? Oh, uh, kind of. Do you ever look at, like, Joel Osteen and these mega churches and think, damn? Yeah. So he was asking about uh, I, whether or not I studied to be a minister when I was younger, um, which the answer is no, but yes. Uh, the intent after I lost my tech job was to go back to school, finish up, go to seminary and be a minister. Um, that didn't work out, uh, although I guess you could say it worked out great. Uh, the other thing is, he says, do I ever look at people like Joel Osteen and go, damn? And I've said many times uh, that uh, while I'm broke as hell and given everything I can to keep doing this stuff, if I ever want to get rich, all I have to do is have a major come to Jesus moment and lose all of my ethical values. <laughs> and I'll be a rich son of a bitch. Mr. JT. I've gotten the chance over the last year to speak to a lot of religious audiences, and both religious uh, people and atheists alike seem to want to see you debate William Lane Craig if you keep ducking you. Well. Let's get that on YouTube. Yeah, so I, I, JT asked about William Lane Craig, who I brought tonight, by the way, um, <laughs> or this morning. Yeah, William Lane Craig's a famous apologist who uh, is monumentally arrogant and formulaic and kind of boring. Uh, are you listening to me, Bill? This is on the internet. Um, he won't debate anybody unless they have a PhD. Now, I don't want to beat him up too much for that because now that I'm getting some notoriety for debating, there are people who send me emails. Joe Bob in Columbia wants to have a big formal debate with me. Well, I mean, I have limited time. Um, I'm happy to debate. I'm not gonna disqualify him for his credentials because that's a fallacy, Bill. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it doesn't look like it's ever gonna happen. I have this, I have this awesome idea, uh, and I, I pitched it to Richard Dawkins, um, but I'll do it with you too, Richard, uh, which is get Craig to agree to a team debate and have somebody with a PhD like Richard Carrier bring me as his teammate, and then Richard can sit over there and write another book while I wipe the floor with this asshole, and he can stop <laughs> claiming this. <laughs> Keith, all my friends are asking, you're all my friends, wow. Do I use humor and has it ever bitten me in the ass? Um, my wife says I'm the funniest guy on the planet, uh, so I'm out for your job. But I, it depends on the debate. It, it depends on the setting. I always try to use some humor somewhere. I try to, try to get a laugh. Um, I try to do things that, that, that kind of uh, get people's mind working in different directions. So I don't know if it count, counts as humor, but one of the things that we did in the meta argument or when, when we talk about um, appeals to testimonials is I talk about how you can go to people right now who will tell you about their alien abduction experience. These are real live people you can talk to right now. Their stories are consistent. Uh, they don't know each other. They're probably not lying. You can make up your mind whether you think they're delusional or correct or whatever, but we don't tend to believe them. We don't tend to believe that there's actually a reptilian alien conspiracy manipulating the entire government, except for that guy over there. But it's, and so when you recognize that, why would you believe 
a bunch of stories from people you don't know, can't identify. I mean, even if we knew the Gospels, for example, were written by eyewitnesses and we had the manuscripts, that doesn't mean that what they're writing is true. How hard is that to figure out? And so I've tried to use things that seem funny, alien abductions. Oh, we're going to laugh at all those crazy people. Stop, you know, messing with our cows and our people in rural areas in an attempt to get people to maybe laugh and then say, hey, wait a minute, if I'm laughing at that belief, and I'm not laughing at my own, and he's comparing the two, I need to figure out what the difference is. And I want them to sit there and struggle forever. Well, not forever, I want them to get past it. But for a while, with what the difference is. Uh, I don't know if I've ever been bitten on the ass for being funny, but you can try it. <laughs> yeah. God, I wish I'd have been there. I mean, okay, so they're, they're, they're doing a debate, and it's supposed to be about a generic deity, and they pulled a bait and switch and started arguing about specifically Christianity? Yes. Uh, I pray for that to happen, actually. Because, first of all, they've lost the debate on the merits, but second of all, beating up this, this idea of a Christian God is so much easier than beating up this abstract God. It's why when you have, like, the Kalam cosmological argument that William Lane Craig uses over and over again, when Cliff Connectly used it in our debate the other day, I'm like, sorry, that, okay, even if I accepted that argument, all it tells me is that at some time there had to be some mind that began the universe. Doesn't tell me if it still exists, doesn't tell me if it's one thing, doesn't tell me anything. It's definitely not about Christianity. Point that out. First of all, I'm not a big fan of the type of thing that Craig does because I don't really do like the academic scored debates. He gets up and says, uh, now what my opponent needs to do in order to prove me wrong, I need to shut the... Uh, yes, is this, 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 and this, and if he doesn't, I've won. I don't, I don't like doing that, but I'm not above doing that when they blatantly violate the rules. What I like to do is say, hey, clearly, we're, we're now done talking about what we came to debate about, um, so I guess you're giving up that point, but I'm happy to discuss this other one as well. But thanks so much, everybody.